if you look down, you'll see a surprise. Once you see it, you will always want it. You know that I will never forget the little visits. You know, the little black forest. I kiss it a thousand times and wait impatiently for the moment I will be in it. To live within Josephine is to live in the Elysian fields, kisses on your mouth, your eyes, your breast, everywhere, everywhere. That is one of Napoleon's love letters to Josephine. We've seen in the trailer of Napoleon movie that Josephine plays a big part in Napoleon's life. I have talked in my Napoleon movie trailer number two reaction how I thought that Josephine was sexualized. But now that I've been looking at all these letters, I would like to discuss them, to discuss the relationship between Napoleon and Josephine, to look at what is represented in these trailers of Napoleon movie, but really to look at the history behind those snippets of Napoleon and Josephine. So let's dive in. At the end of his life, Napoleon allegedly said, France, the army, Josephine. Three words that contributed to mythologize and create a legend around the relationship between Napoleon and Josephine. She was his wife for 13 years. He made her empress of France. He has sent her passionate letters when he was in Italy in a military campaign. These letters are full of love and eroticism. However, when we really look at the evidence, it seems that the legend of the great love between Napoleon and Josephine, and here I'm not saying they didn't exist, I'm saying it was extrapolated. When we really look at the evidence, we can see that it was extrapolated. We can see that it was also about propaganda. As I said before in my reactions to the Napoleon movie trailers, Josephine was a key for Napoleon to be introduced to the Parisian elites. I also believe that there was lots of infatuation between the two. You can't deny this when you look at the passion in Napoleon's letters for Josephine. But I think the relationship is more complex. And when you really look at all the letters that Napoleon sent to Josephine, it is not just about passion. There is a lot of toxicity. It was said when Napoleon was fighting the wars and winning his battles, Josephine was his sweet lover, his sweet wife, waiting passionately for him. That's the propaganda, that's the myth around Josephine. Josephine was not a perfect woman. Um, I don't think anyone is perfect anyway. She had her own desires, she had her own agency, she had her own influence. She's also a very much complex character and I hope that in that movie, Napoleon movie, we see that as well. We see the complexity behind that woman who really seduced Napoleon but who also had her own agenda. I think it's also important to remember where they met actually and they met in the busy Libertine silence of 1795 when the burning zeal of the French Revolution had already died down a bit and a new aristocracy was still doing more or less the same things the old one had done. You know, you just replace one elite with another. Napoleon was 26 years old and with lots of talent, probably more talent than money and wealth and connections. Josephine was six years older than him and had become after her husband, Viscount Alexandre de Beauharnais, was guillotine one of the best known widows in Parisian society. A very wealthy woman, a very well-connected woman, was meeting a very talented military man. Everyone, everyone around here. What is this costume you have on? This is my uniform. I led the French victory at Toulon. 
What is your name? Napoleon. As the course of my life just changed. There is no doubt that when Napoleon met Josephine, he was completely fascinated and infatuated by her. In just six months, he married her in a civil ceremony at Paris City Hall. On the marriage certificate, both lied about their age. She took four years off and he added one. Because obviously there's this complexity as well of always having the woman older and I think not to want to look that much older. But it's quite funny that they did that, that it mattered to them, you know, in the 18th century, you know, late 18th century, early 19th century. I think it's quite interesting and I think it quite reveals as well about the dynamic between... Um, between them and in their relationship. Only two days after the wedding, Napoleon had to leave and he was in command of the army of Italy. There are rumours that once he was over there, Josephine was unfaithful to him and took many lovers in Paris and enjoyed her life there. That's where we have lots of letters about them and it's very complex on how he talked really to Josephine and what he told her and what he said to her. When he came back from Italy, you know, Napoleon didn't really know what was going on and they resumed their love affair. I mean, again, it was a toxic passion. They were very much infatuated with one another. I would say though that Napoleon at that time was more infatuated with her and then there's going to be a shift. But when he had to go back to Egypt, the situation started again and rumors again about her being, you know, unfaithful, starting to really to spread out. And now he was going to start to listen to what people were saying about her and she was going to be more and more careless about her lovers and use people that he might know, basically. The rumour is that it was actually in Egypt that he was told about Josephine's infidelities. And here we can see how much it might have hurt him to learn about the love of his life not being faithful to him. While he's fighting, you know, and trying to conquer, you know, all the territories, she was just having a good time um, with other men. Um, and so it is quite very difficult for Napoleon to hear the truth about the woman he married. But he did not ask for a divorce. Instead, he gradually drifted away from her. And it's so funny because when he started like drifting from her, she started being the one who was jealous. She started being the one who was interested in him. So again, a very complex and difficult relationship. Again, a very toxic relationship. He started taking his own lovers, she started becoming very jealous, she started spending lots of money in Paris and really annoying him with her taste for luxury. When Napoleon crowned himself in 1805, there was the question also of succession, of having an heir. And he was not interested in like repeating himself and finding someone else at the time. He crowned Josephine. But here I don't think that we can see it as something personal. I think by that time there was lots of stuff and bad stuff that had happened in their relationship. And actually he's doing that for political reasons. And she is going to be obviously very pleased with it because she's going to become Empress of France. But funny enough it's you know at the height of her success of becoming Empress of France it's also when she's losing more and more agency and influence because she has less and less liberties and freedom. Their relationship became really sour and bad, but it lasted four more years after the coronation as emperor and empress of France. The couple's struggle really reached a point when Napoleon got one of Josephine's ladies-in-waiting pregnant. Until then, Napoleon seemed to have thought that he might have been kind of sterile and so there was no point of trying to get another woman. Now he knew that he wasn't and that he could have children and it was one of his main goals to have his own personal, also political, legacy. They finally divorced in 1809 in the middle of one of the 
ugliest phases of the Napoleonic Wars, and especially the Spanish War of Independence. What's interesting though that is that despite their divorce and their complicated relationship, Napoleon never took away the title of Emperor of France from Josephine. And here, you know, you can speculate why, but I do think that it's also because he recognized how much she had given him, how much he owed it to her. I'm not talking here about the military genius. I'm talking here about the political career and the network and influence she had and that she shared with him at a time where he needed it most. So I think Napoleon must have been a very loyal here person despite their fights and their problems. Napoleon will remarried and his new wife was Mary Louise of Austria, daughter of the King of Austria, Francis I, and belonged to the House of Habsburg. With her in 1811, he finally managed to have the long-awaited heir Napoleon François Joseph Charles Bonaparte, who is commonly known as Napoleon II. Once Napoleon joked about his wife saying, I married a womb, which is absolutely atrocious. I think he had his passion, his love, uh, toxic passion, infatuation with Josephine, and then he had the need of having an heir and marrying the wife he wanted, to, the mother of his children that he wanted, the, the, the dynastic, you know, alliance that he wanted. So two different type of marriages and two different type of women. There are two letters that I find very interesting to show the complicated relationship between Napoleon and Josephine that highlights best the complexity behind their love. The first one was written in December 1795 in Paris. Josephine I wake filled with thoughts of you. Your portrait and the in intoxicating evening which we spent yesterday have left my senses in turmoil. Sweet incomparable Josephine. What a strange effect you have on my heart. Are you angry? Do I see you looking sad? Are you worried? My soul aches with sorrow and there can be no rest for you, lover. But here is there still more in store for me when, yielding to the profound feelings which overwhelm me, I draw from your lips, from your heart, love which consume me with fire. Ah! It was last night that I fully realised how false an image of you your portrait gives. You are leaving at noon. I shall see you in three hours. Until then, mi yo dolce amor. A thousand kisses, but give me none in return, for they set my blood on fire. So here we really like, he's just going to see her in three hours. He's completely consumed with her, with the love for her, with this full attraction for her. The other letter that really, I think, encapsulates their relationship, their toxic relationship, is the one that was sent in spring 1797 to Josephine. I love you no longer. On the contrary, I detest you. You are a wretch, truly perverse, truly stupid, a real Cinderella. You never write to me at all. You do not love your husband, you know the pleasure that your letters give me, yet you cannot even manage to write him half a dozen lines, dashed off in a moment. What then do you do all day, madam? What business is so vital that it robs you of the time to write to your faithful lover? What attachment can be stifling and pushing aside the love, the tender and constant love which you promised him? Who can this wonderful new lover be who takes up your every moment, rules your days and prevents you from devoting your attention to your husband. Beware, Josephine, one fine night the doors will be broken down and there I shall be. In truth, I am worried, my love, to have no news from you. Write me a full page later, instantly, made up from those delightful words which fill my heart with emotion and joy. I hope to hold you in my arms before long, when I shall lavish upon you a million kisses, burning as the equatorial son, Napoleon. Here you see the conflicting feelings. He's like, he detests her, he loves her. And you see the thin line between love and hate, between feeling loved and adored and feeling rejected and put aside. The truth is 
as I said, you know, the relationship between Josephine and Napoleon was more complex than we can think of. But there's one letter that he wrote as well to his brother, Joseph, that really shows how conflicted he was himself with his own feelings for Josephine. The veil is torn. It is sad when one and the same heart is torn by such conflicting feelings for one person. I need to be alone. I am tired of grandeur. All my feelings have dried up. I no longer care about my glory. At 29, I have exhausted everything. And here I think that, you know, the link between his greatness and his relationship with Josephine shows how much he was also truly a human being behind this big name, this big hat and these big victories. He was a man who felt. He was the man who had been taken for granted by a woman. He was the man who had been hurt by a woman. He was the man who also was going to hurt her. And I think we need to have a better understanding of this complex relationship to have a better understanding of Napoleon himself. And these letters are absolutely amazing because they reveal so much about these two characters and the complexity. And again, I really hope that in the Napoleon movie, we're going to see that complex relationship and that we probably move a bit away from the legend and more about, you know, the true men and women behind these big names, Napoleon and Josephine. I really hope that you enjoyed that History Police video that gives another glimpse into the Napoleon trailer movies. And I hope you'll enjoy as well the Napoleon movie because I like everyone has their opinion about the casting and everything. But in the end of the day, I think it will be a very entertaining movie and that we will all be able to enjoy it. At the very least, we, we all want to know the true story, the real story about Napoleon. Be aware, I will be sharing with you a video on the real history of Napoleon when the movie is released. So watch this space. I'll also make kind of an ultimate guide where I'll put all my videos for you on the Napoleon movie trailer reactions and everything so for you to have everything in one place but I will be adding some content so watch this space thank you so much for being here thank you so much for your support and I'll see you next time bye